I'm so glad you could join us for our online service. I've got a great word about expecting miracles. Before we get to that, we've got an online meet and greet. Send a link to everyone you know. Tell them about our service. Let's get as many people each week watching our services. All right. I'll see you on the other side of the meet and greet. start looking at some of the miracles that Jesus performed in the Gospel of Mark. And of course, the Gospels are chock full of miracles. But it's something that, uh, for, for some Christians, it's, you know, we accept it, we understand it, we realize that Jesus healed, uh, did miracles, raised Lazarus from the dead, healed those that had blind eyes. I mean, you know, and, and, and many accept it, but other Christians are a little bit more skeptical. And then you take an unbeliever and they're kind of like scratching their heads going, oh, what? What's going on? So I just thought it was important for us to, to talk about this a little more at length, just like I did when I talked about the supernatural for the last couple of weeks and the casting out of, of demons. Because again, in a rationalistic Western context, where we're so much uh, driven by science and technology, we tend to not make room for the supernatural. But as I talked about it last week, we miss one third of the pieces of the puzzle, as it were, the reality, the vision of reality that we should be seeing. We take into account the human, we take into account the natural, but we forget about the supernatural. And miracles uh, fall into that same category. In fact, we're going to look at an account of Jesus healing uh, people. And, and again, if you are uh, uh, beholden to rationalism, you're going to look at it with a lot of skepticism. And so we want to talk about that today. So let me just define a miracle. Again, I'm defining this from a book called A Simple Guide to Experiencing Miracles by J.P. Moreland. It's an excellent book. It just came out last year. But he simply says this, a miracle is an event or an intervention that is caused by a special act of God or some other supernatural being that is, that is an exception to the ordinary law-governed course of nature for some specific purpose. So it's something God does, it's something supernatural that is an, except, an exception to the law-governed state of the created cosmic order. Um, Probably was it five years ago, I injured my leg. Uh, many of you know I run, and um, I had been running for several years without stretching because <laughs> I was stretching and I was getting all these um, uh, muscle aches and cramps. So I stopped running uh, or stopped, stopped um, stretching. Well, long story short, because I didn't, and maybe it's because I'm getting older, although I don't want to tell myself that, uh, I had a pretty significant. Uh, injury uh, to where I couldn't run, couldn't hardly walk, was limping wherever I went. And this was in the fall of 2018. And so this went on, you know, for about four or five months. And of course, it's very frustrating to me because I love to be outside. I love to run. I love to be out in God's creation. And, uh, you know, thought, gosh, I guess I'm going to be off 
my legs or off my running legs, so to speak, for, for a long extended period of time. Well, to make a really long story short, we had some individuals come to our church, Dick and Lena McNeese, who have a healing anointing on their lives. And so when he called for people to come forth uh, to be healed at the end of the service, I came up. And I kid you not, he laid his hands on the side of my, uh, my, my stomach and my, my leg area, and it felt as if hot, liquid, hot oil went up and down my leg. And suddenly I was able to move my leg and, and you know, it felt really, really good. Now, I didn't start running right away. In fact, I waited several weeks after that. But I was healed. I was completely whole. And I've never looked back and never had pain since. Although I must add, I am stretching now to be smart about that. Okay, you don't want to be foolish about it. But, but I've experienced healing. And that was a miracle. It was a miracle in that I, I had gone to doctors and they said, listen, you're not going to be able to run for a while. You're going to have to stay off that thing. Do you want to do an MRI and all that good stuff? And I said, nah, I'll just rest it. But again, I went from not being able to walk hardly and limping very, very uh, markedly to being completely healed. I've experienced a miracle. I've experienced healing. And so this morning we're going to talk about that, coming to terms with uh, miracles and, and with healing. So let's look at the go in the Gospel of Mark, the first chapter, verses 29 to 45. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told Jesus about her. And so he went to her and took her by the hand and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and the demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Father God, I pray as we look into your word, as it concerns miracles and healing, I pray give us eyes to see and ears to hear what your spirit wants to reveal to us. I pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. So what do we are to make of these words? these healing mir miracles. Uh, what are we to make of them? It, it's interesting because it says in Mark 131 that when Jesus uh, went and took the hand of Peter's mother-in-law, it said the fever left her. Um, uh, that is actually a mild way that the Greek renders it, is that basically it means that the fever forsook her, is that something uh, somewhat even violent took place to where this woman was set free, and some theologians believe some form of demonic attack on this, this woman's life. So it was really, really powerful. And, and again, it brings to the forefront, and we see this all throughout the Gospels, Jesus heals. Jesus does miracles. And, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but he promises that same power and authority upon his followers today. And so what do we do with this? And, and one common pushback to all this is, well, that was in a pre-scientific age. That was something that happened maybe back then, but it doesn't happen now. In fact, God has given us the gift of medicine and technology and science and all those kinds of things. So we don't really need that. You can just go to the doctor. But we've got to recognize that healing and miracles didn't just stop with Jesus in his life and ministry. It carried over into the book of Acts. All throughout the book of Acts, people are getting healed. People are getting raised from the dead. There are incredible things that God is doing. And in fact, there are accounts going up well until the 5th century AD of people being healed. Let me just give you just a few examples that I think are really powerful. This was a Christian. His name was uh, Quadratus. And this was in the second century. He said this, But the works of our Savior were always present, for they were true. Those who were cured, those who rose from the dead, who not merely appeared as cured and risen, but were constantly present, not only when the Savior was living, but even for some time after he had gone, so that some of them survived even to our own time. So there were those that were healed in Jesus' lifetime and beyond, that were still well living and testifying as to the healing power of God well into the second century. This is Irenaeus, um, uh, again, another Christian in the, um, 
second century and up into the third century AD that basically said this. He said, uh, wherefore also those who were in truth his disciples, receiving grace from him, do in his name and perform miracles so as to promote the welfare of other men. Some heal the sick by laying hands upon them, and they are made whole. Again, this is in the late 100s A.D. up into the early 200s uh, A.D. Moving forward into the 3rd century, in the life uh, and, and the ministry of Origen, okay, who lived from A.D. 184 to A.D. 253. By these, the names of God and the names of Jesus... We have also seen many delivered from serious ailments and from mental distractions and madness, countless other diseases which neither men nor demons had cured. And then moving forward into the 5th century AD, into the life of St. Augustine. In 426 AD, in the City of God, St. Augustine wrote this, I realized how many miracles were occurring in our own day and which were so like the miracles of old, and also how wrong it would be to allow the memory of those marvels of divine power to perish from among our people. It is only two years ago that the keeping of records was begun here in Hippo, and already at this writing we have nearly 70 attested miracles. So in other words, this was going on for hundreds and hundreds of years after the death of of Jesus. And so we need to recognize why does God heal? Why does God do miracles through the hands of his people? Okay? To first of all to meet real needs, obviously if people are sick, in my case, I couldn't hardly walk and I certainly couldn't run. But but second of all, to provide signs and and um, uh, miracles to attest that God is really real. He really is alive. He really does do wonders today. He really does care for people, and it prepares hearts for salvation. And so another concept we need to see in this section of Scripture is not just the miracles, all right, uh, but, but also Jesus' authority, okay? Because it says in Mark 134, Jesus healed many who had various diseases, but he also drove out many demons. He would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. And so the central theological theme here is the authority of Jesus and, and the power of Jesus. Because remember, as I said when we began this series, power was really important to the Roman mind. And, and Mark was writing this gospel to appeal to Roman sensibilities, things that they would be interested in. There's a lot less here in Mark's gospel talking about the Old Testament scriptures, but there's a whole lot of using the word immediately. And, and, and miracles. Again, this would appeal to a Roman mind that was all about power, the, the expression of power through the Roman military might. And so here's some, some um, uh, expressions of the power of God uh, written by Tertullian, who was an early Greek apologist in the second century, I believe, who wrote this, again, appealing to the Roman mind appealing to the need for the Romans to make room for the authority of Jesus to deal with the demonic realm, which the Romans and all of their wisdom and power couldn't deal with. Here's what he says. But who would rescue you if Christians were to withdraw from those secret enemies that everywhere lay waste your minds and bodily health? I mean from the assaults of demons whom we drive out of you without reward, without pay. Why, this alone would have sufficed to avenge us, to leave you open and exposed to unclean spirits with immediate possession. He wrote that in his apology. And then in a letter to another Roman, uh, the letter is called To Scalpula. He says this, For the secretary of certain gentlemen, when he was suffering from falling sickness caused by a demon, was freed from it. So also were the relatives of some of the others and a certain little boy. And heaven knows how many distinguished men, to say nothing of common people, have been cured of either devils or their sicknesses. Again, to a Roman mind, they're like, oh my goodness, there is a power that these Christians have, those that follow this Jesus, that we don't have all of our Roman military might, all of our chariots, all of our weaponry, the Colosseum, <laughs> the gladiatorial games. None of that compares with the power that these Christians have. And so this, this brings to the forefront why Jesus was healing people and why he was casting out devils. Because 
Yes, Jesus came to do that. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus came to set the captives free. But even more important to that, he was coming to restore all of humanity and the cosmos from the power of sin and the power of, of the devil. In other words, he was not just trying to, to heal a, a person here or there. He's trying to fix the fundamental problem with humanity, the fallenness of humanity, the fallenness of creation, the brokenness and the injustice of humanity, the brokenness of the created world. Jesus came to restore all of that. So when you see miracles, when you see uh, people you know, delivered from demons, you see a preview of coming attractions. You see a preview of the new creation. You see a preview of the new heavens and the new earth. That's what Jesus was trying to do. And so when you see in Isaiah chapter 34, verses 4 through 6, these incredible promises, many theologians will tell us what we read here in Isaiah 35 is a preview of Jesus' ministry. In other words, they were forecasting or foretelling what was to come and the fact that God through Jesus was going to set right every single wrong. Let me read this to you. Isaiah 35 verses 4 to 6. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong. Do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and mute tongues will shout for joy, water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. And so we see here <laughs> God's plan to reclaim fallen creation and its broken people. That's what Jesus is trying to do. So whenever you see a miracle in the New Testament, it is a foretaste of the new heavens and the new earth, where there will be no sickness, where there will be no pain, where there will be no injustice, where there will be no brokenness, where there will be no tornadoes or hurricanes or earthquakes or any of the type of the, you know, the, the atmospheric, you know, problems that we have on this, this fallen, fallen planet. We got to realize that. So, so miracles are really, really important. Miracles are not going away. In fact, miracles and the restoration of humanity and the restoration of creation is part and parcel of God's plan for, for humanity and the entire cosmos. So what's a balanced perspective on miracles and healing today? Well, there's generally two camps in Christianity. Well, I shouldn't say that. There's two extremes, okay? The right way is somewhere in the middle, okay? One extreme is that there are Christians that totally reject miracles today or that God doesn't heal today, or God doesn't do miracles today, or people don't speak in tongues today, and people don't cast out devils today, and there is no such thing as words of wisdom and words of knowledge. That may have happened in the Gospels, that may have happened in the book of Acts, but that was a special dispensation. It doesn't happen today. Okay? Why is that? Well, there's a number of reasons. One is, again, what I've been talking about for the last couple of weeks, in the Western world, people are beholden to rationalism. The fact that with our own human reasoning, our own autonomous human reasoning, we can figure things out. We can develop medicines and, and medical uh, healings and medical uh, practices to bring healing for people, so we don't need healing today. Uh, and so, so th that's one line of reasoning. Uh, another, <laughs> which is a little more extreme, is that God controls all sickness and he sends it as a punishment for sin. So why would God send healing why would God use people to lay their hands on the sick and see them healed if God sends sickness as punishment for sin? Okay, you can see the problem with that. Another is that God um, allowed healing to take place in the ministry of Jesus and in apostolic times in the early church. But then after that, he kind of closed the book on it or the door closed. <clears throat> now, what's interesting about that is L Martin Luther and John Calvin. Uh, two great leading lights within what they call the Magisterial Reformation were cessationalists. They did not believe that God healed today. And so when you talk to Lutherans today, when you talk to people from the Reformed movement, the Reformed camp of Christianity, you will see that many of them are cessationalists. Or they're like, yeah, I don't think so. And, and what's interesting, there's a very good reason why they became cessationalists in their day. Again, we're talking... 1500s, okay? The Catholics 
who, again, Luther and Calvin were protesting against because of all of their abuses and all of their bad theology. Well, Catholics claimed healings, and Catholics claimed miracles. And so for Luther and Calvin, they equated that with bad theology and all the other abuses of the Catholic Church. But they felt that just because God wasn't healing through their ministries, it didn't mean that their theology was bad. In fact, they felt that they had the proper, the right, the orthodox theology, and the Catholics didn't. Although the Catholics claimed healings and miracles. And so what happened with Luther and Calvin and Lutheranism and the Reformed movements today is they threw out the baby with the bathwater. In their attempt to try to you know, reform the church and, and try to purify the church from some of the, or many of the unorthodox and unbiblical teachings of Catholicism, they threw out the baby healing along with the bad bathwater of the bad theology, and that thinking remains today. And so that's where you get a number of people that are, well, within Lutheran camps and reform camps and others um, that reject healing today, okay? So that's one extreme. Well, then there's another extreme that thinks that you should be healed every single time that people pray in faith for healing, okay? Now, there's a number of scriptures that I could use. I'm just going to use one. Again, time doesn't permit me to be exhaustive here. But if you look at Mark chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, it talks about the fact that it cre if someone has faith, you can be healed. If you don't have faith, you can't be healed. But if you do have faith, you can be healed. Okay. So look what it says here in Mark 6, verse 5. Jesus could, do, could not do many miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. So there's, there's one strain, strain of teaching that if you have faith, you can be healed every time. Okay? Which strands of Christianity teach this? The Word of Faith movement teaches this. Um, many segments of the charismatic movement, not all, but many segments of the charismatic movement teach that as well. Um, if you're familiar with the Bethel movement in, in Redding, California, and I've, I've listened to and re listened to a lot of preaching and listened to and, and read uh, much of what they teach, you'll see some of their teachers say you can be healed every single time, and, and God expects it, okay? That's an extreme form of teaching, okay? Because we understand in the scriptures, not everyone gets healed, okay? Paul, the great apostle who wrote almost two-thirds of the New Testament, had a thorn in his flesh, a messenger of Satan sent to torment him. He prayed to the Lord three times. You can see this in 2 Corinthians 12. And God never took away that torment from him. In fact, he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And, and so we see that in, in the scriptures that not everyone gets healed. And I could use other examples. James, in James chapter 1, verse 2 says, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds because the testing of your faith develops perseverance and perseverance produces character and character produces perseverance and faith and let you know and, and so so we see in the scriptures that there are examples of testings that we endure that uh, God for, for, for some reason allows okay so we've got to recognize that God doesn't heal every time now I could go on and talk about it more, but I'm not going to, other than to say this. Just because not all people are healed when they are prayed for, prayed for doesn't mean you stop praying for the sick. doesn't mean you stop believing for healing. But we cannot allow this to become something where we, we, we think that every single time we pray for somebody, they, they are to be healed. And because what's the problem with that? Well, the problem with that is now you accuse that person of not having any faith, you accuse that person of being in sin. And again, that's not necessarily biblical as well. In fact, E.W. Kenyon, who was the main influence on Kenneth Hagin, and Kenneth Hagin is the forerunner and the producer of the Word of Faith movement. People like Kenneth Copeland and others draw from that stream. Okay? They draw from, from, from a guy by the name of E.W. Kenyon. And E.W. Kenyon was strongly influenced in the late 1800s by New Thought philosophy and by Christian science, mind over matter. Okay? Again, we're talking about an extreme here. This is what he said. Okay? He said this, 
when these truths, again, the fact that you can always be healed, when these truths really gain ascendancy, they will make us spiritual supermen, masters of demons and disease. It will be the end of weakness and failure. There will be no more struggle for faith, for all things are ours. There will be no more praying for power, for he is in us. In the presence of these tremendous realities, we arise and take our place. We go out, we go out and live like supermen indwelt by God. Okay, that, my friends, is heretical. That, my friends, is not biblical Christianity, and that is certainly not a biblical understanding of healing. Okay, so what do we do with all this? There's one extreme that says God doesn't heal today. There's another extreme that says, hey, you can be healed every single time. Okay, <laughs> the truth lies in the middle. What's the middle? Jesus said to pray for the sick. Jesus told his followers that you will cast out devils. You can see this in Mark 16th chapter. You can see Jesus talk about this in Luke chapter 10. He said, I've given you authority over all the power of the devil and nothing shall by any means harm you. So there are promises of power that Jesus gave to us. In fact, if you look at John chapter 14 verse 12, he said this, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I'm going to my Father. So the truth lies in the middle. It's not God doesn't heal today, and it's not God heals every time. Jesus gave us authority. Jesus gave us power. Jesus said the same things that I'm doing, you're going to do. In fact, I, great, you're going to do even greater things than these because I'm going to my Father. All right, so that's important for us to recognize. And James in James chapter 5, explicitly calls upon church leaders to pray for the sick and pray for their healing. Let me read James chapter 5, 13. If any of you, is any of you in trouble, he should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is anyone sick? He should call the elders of the church, pray over him, and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make that sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and, and effective. So in that you see not cessationalism and not superhumanism or you know the fact that we can be supermen, but this plain fact that Jesus said you can heal. I call you to heal. I call you to pray for the sick. I call you to do the same works that I've been doing. And we see in a New Testament epistle, uh, a, a church leader saying, listen, if someone's sick, call them up, pray for them. So, so what does this mean for us? How do we come to terms with miracles? Okay, This would challenge us to take more risks and pray for the sick. If someone's sick, pray for them. Hey, in the grocery store, your, your living room, the church, wherever, pray for the sick. Increase our expectations of what God can do to restore the prayer for healing in its proper place in our lives and in the life of the church. A big reason why God doesn't heal today in many Christian churches is because it's either not preached or we don't have expectations for it. We don't have faith, but not just we don't have faith. We say, hey, God doesn't do that anymore. Or even if we believe God does that, we don't go up for prayer when we're sick. Or we don't pray for someone when they are sick because we get fearful or intimidated. And so, so there, in other words, God wants to heal. God wants to heal today. God does heal today. But there's also a responsibility on our part to, to, to extend our faith, to take risks, to step up and pray for somebody that's sick or get prayed for ourselves. And so we need to come to terms with miracles and with healing because God still does that today. And it's important for us to understand that. So hopefully you are challenged and encouraged today by this. And I'm going to continue this theme next week. Can I pray for you? Father God, let us be a people that believe that you heal today. Let us be a people that stand on what your word says about healing and miracles. And that God, you still heal today. Let us be a people that take risks, that step out in our faith and pray for those that are sick or receive healing ourselves. Father God, I pray for this, God, that God, we would be a people that are a miraculous people because we see the hand of God moving today in our own lives. I pray for this now, Father, in Jesus' name.
Amen. Church, it was great to be with you. Until next week, I call you blessed. Take care.